Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you all this morning for worship. I'm so glad that you are joining us and so glad to have you here with us this morning. I pray that this morning is a blessing to you. I pray that you are filled with joy and grace and peace and that this worship service helps to encourage that for each of you. And so we will begin our worship this morning with our opening music. My life goes on.
We continue our worship this morning with our opening prayer. Let us pray. O God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair, deliver your sons and daughters from fear, and preserve us in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. St. James Children's Programming is available on our website at stjameslimerick.org. From the Connect menu, click Kids Connect blog. Hi friends! I have something special in our children's message today. Several of our friends from Kids Connect were able to help me create today's story. This month's theme is indescribable. Your creator has no limits. That means we're going to be talking about creativity, imagining what you could do because you're made in God's image. Our story comes from Genesis chapter 1 and part of chapter 2. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were above, under the dome and from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night. And there was evening. And there was morning, the fourth day. God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea, monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God Bless the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Bottom line, there's no limit to God's creativity. 
In fact, God's creativity is so huge that it's hard for us to even understand. After all, God is indescribable. In Psalm 145, verse 3, David put it this way, Lord, you are great. You are really worthy of praise. No one can completely understand how great you are. Here's one thing I do understand, though. I can trust God no matter what. I can't always understand him or even know everything about him, but I can trust him. And that might be the most indescribable thing of all. So this week, take time to look around at all the things that God created. Take a look in the mirror too. After all, you were made in God's image. Each one of us was created to think, feel, and act just a tiny bit like him. I'd like to thank my friends for helping me today. Ava De Pasquale, Juliana Hefner, Brady Sislove, Colby Sislove, and Kinley Sislove. Thanks, friends.
A reading from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 16. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came, and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. May God bless the reading of his word. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Good morning. Grace and peace from God our Father and from Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior. Well, when I was a child, I had a lot of surgeries on my legs to help me walk better. But each and every time I went to the hospital, and there were something like 40 occasions, I was petrified. I was really afraid of injections, and I wasn't really crazy about lime green jello or using a bedpan. And every single time I went to the hospital, I really wanted my mom there all the time, because I truly believed that if my mom were there, I wouldn't be afraid at all. <laughs> but the truth is, I was still scared, even with my mom there. I was just exceedingly glad that she wasn't going to leave me alone and that she would see me through every scary thing that needed to happen. Sometimes as Christians, I think we can believe, well, if only I were 100% sure God was with me, 
I wouldn't be scared, not at all. And there are plenty of examples in the Bible where when God is present, someone has no fear. But there are an equal number of stories of people being afraid even when God is present with them. And right now, dear friends, we do have a lot to be afraid of, don't we? I mean, certainly the number of increasing cases of COVID-19. And what exactly are the after effects or the ramifications of getting COVID? And then how are our children going to go back to school safely? Or if they don't, how are parents going to deal with work responsibilities and their children learning at home online? Add to that economic worries. Or maybe you're struggling with some other things like medical tests that still need to be done, diagnoses that still need to be made. Maybe there are relationships in your life that are really difficult, things that we can truly be fearful about. Well, that's why today I would like us to think about two heroes of the faith who were both aware of God's presence and yet afraid. So from the Old Testament, we are going to think about the prophet Elijah and his journey with God. And we're going to talk about Peter, a, a disciple, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Okay, so here's a little of the backstory, the Cliff Notes version about Elijah. During the time that we just read about in the Old Testament, Israel was experiencing a severe drought. And this is because the people of God, the Israelites, had turned away from God and were worshiping false gods under the influence of Queen Jezebel. In order to turn the people back to the true God, the one true God of Israel, there was going to be a showdown of power on Mount Carmel between Elijah and God, and the false prophets, and their false gods. Well, the false prophets went first. And for literally hours, they called upon their non-existent gods to show forth their power. <laughs> and not surprisingly, nothing happened. And then it was Elijah's turn. And Elijah built an altar to God. He put the animal sacrifice on that altar. He wet the whole thing down, and he literally dug a little trench around the altar and filled that with water. And then God was prayed to by Elijah. Elijah prayed to God and called down the power of God. And God sent a fire so fierce that it burned up the entire altar and the stones that built it and the water that surrounded it. And when the Israelites, the people of God, saw this power of God, they said, God is the true God of Israel. They turned back to him, and at Elijah's prompting, they killed the false prophets. Now, you need to know, when Jezebel heard about this, she went absolutely ballistic. She lost her mind, and she vowed that she was going to have Elijah killed. And Elijah... Well, it seems that the threats of Queen Jezebel filled him with such fear that he somehow forgot the miraculous power of God that he had just seen, and he went running for his life. He was so afraid that he ran some 200 miles. And... This whole time that he was running, filled with fear, becoming very fatigued, God was right there with him, providing for him every step of the way, miraculously giving him food and water, telling him to rest, that he needed to take care of himself. And eventually, Elijah winds up hiding in a cave. And the Bible says that at that point, Elijah is so filled, not only with fear, but with fatigue, 
that he becomes depressed and at points literally wants to die. He just wants to give up on it all because of his fear and fatigue. And the disciple Peter, well, when we read about him, you have to know that before the storm on the Sea of Galilee, Peter and the other disciples had been with Jesus all day teaching and preaching under the hot sun. And about dinner time, nobody had the energy to go. And so Jesus miraculously feeds over 5,000 people. And it was the disciples' job to hand out that divine food to over 5,000 people. And then they had to clean up and make sure all the leftovers were accounted for. So by the end of the day, they were fatigued. And in the evening, they find themselves in a little boat on the Sea of Galilee, and a horrific storm comes up. Gigantic waves and howling wind. And guess what? Jesus isn't with them. He went away by himself to pray. So we're told that all night, the, the disciples battle this horrific storm, and they are exhausted physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And around 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus sees them in trouble, and he walks out to them on the sea. Now, with the wind and the waves, the disciples feel like they have seen a ghost, and they are, if they were afraid before, now they are absolutely terrified. I can feel for Elijah and Peter, can't you? We know what it's like to be afraid, and we know what it's like to be filled with fatigue. So many people since the pandemic have talked to me not only about being afraid, but feeling literally exhausted, depleted, having trouble thinking outside of the box or creatively. People are struggling with that fatigue and that fear. But fortunately, the story doesn't end there. And the second thing that I want us to see that Peter and Elijah had in common was that they were both absolutely 100% certain that God was present with them. Now, we left Elijah in a cave, hiding for fear from Jezebel. And we're told that the voice of the Lord comes to Elijah, and I absolutely love this. God asks Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? Now, in that simple question, I hear a lot more than one question. I hear God saying to Elijah, Elijah, how could you forget about me and all the power that I have displayed in your life and through your life? Haven't I protected you every step of the way? Haven't I been with you? Come on, Elijah, you know me. Why are you so afraid, my friend? I don't think Eli Elijah was spoken to by God in anger. I think God was being loving and kind. And God was being merciful to his servant. But to remind Elijah of his power, the Bible says that God again shows his power to Elijah in a windstorm and then an earthquake and then with fire. But the Bible says God isn't in any of those things. God is in this gentle voice that speaks to Elijah to encourage him to express care and concern and love. Sorry, I have to break a minute. Redhead. Where the heck? <laughs> Where did I stop? That's terrible. I just lost my thought. I don't know what made me do that. Uh, What are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. All righty, I'm back. So even though God was there, even though he spoke to Elijah with kindness and gentleness, we're told, and his, Elijah's answer demonstrates it, 
that he is still fill, filled with fear and depression and despair, even in God's presence. And remember Peter in this wicked storm, now terrified that this figure is a ghost? Jesus calls out to the disciples and says, don't be afraid, it's me, it's Jesus. And Peter does something quite astounding. Now some would say maybe a little crazy, some would say incredibly brave. Because when Peter hears that it's Jesus, he says, well, Jesus, if it's really you, go ahead and call me to come out on the water with you. And Jesus, he says, come on, come, Peter. And Peter gets out of the boat. Now, the waves are just as big. The wind is just as strong. But Peter gets out of the boat. And we don't know how many steps he was able to take or how far he literally got. But suddenly, the waves caught his attention. And that howling, wicked wind, it began to be the only thing he could hear. And he was filled with fear. Even though Jesus was standing right, right ahead of him. And Peter, in fear, began to sink. I don't know about you, but I have certainly had those times when I know, when I am certain that God is with me, and yet I have been filled with fear. And an advantage that we have over Elijah and Peter is that we have the Holy Spirit, the presence of God living in us to give us all the courage and encouragement, all the wisdom and strength we need and yet we can still be afraid. So I, I want to share a story with you. Before I was even on staff here as a volunteer, I covered for Pastor Stewart when he was on vacation. And I'll never forget the night that I got a call at 3 o'clock in the morning that someone from our congregation was dying in a hospital in Philadelphia, and the family needed me to come. So I said, absolutely, I will be right there hung up the phone, and as soon as I realized what I had said, I was filled with fear. Number one, I was afraid that I'd never find the hospital. Number two, I was afraid that I would be in an accident driving at 3 o'clock in the morning in an area that I had never been before. And then, even harder, I was afraid, what if I'm late? What if I don't make it in time? And I'm never with that person, and I disappoint their family. And maybe what I was most afraid of is what if when I get there, I don't have any prayers to pray? What if I don't have anything helpful to say? What then, God? And I was truly afraid. Maybe you've experienced that, knowing that God is with you, and yet you're still afraid. Maybe you've had that nagging doubt. Well, if I only believed harder. If I only believed more, then I wouldn't be afraid. Well, that's where I think the story of Elijah and Peter is truly, truly good news. Because Elijah and Peter were not finished with God. That fear that they experienced in God's presence did not discount them. Now, some commentators will say the opposite. They say that when Elijah was in that cave and he was still afraid after God had showed him all that power and all that love and his presence, that God benched him. And yes, it is true that God said to Elijah, you're going to hand off your ministry now. But again, remember, God spoke to Elijah in a gentle whisper. I think God was encouraging Elijah, much in the way that a pitcher who has pitched a great game, let's say seven innings, and the coach sees that they got nothing left to give, doesn't the coach come out on the mound and encourage the pitcher and say, well done, why don't you come back to the dugout and rest that multi-million dollar arm? There are definitely more games left to be played. And that, I think, is what was happening with Elijah. God was helping him 
to hand off his ministry after a job well done. Because God walked Elijah through his fear out of that cave to meet Elisha, to hand off ministry, and then God continued to walk him over the Jordan and right into a chariot of fire to take Elijah to heaven. That's not failure. That's fulfillment, even in the face of fear. And what's even more glorious is that we're told that years later, Elijah will appear with Moses and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus reveals his glory to his disciples. God was not done with Elijah. God had a plan and a purpose to continue with him, to walk him through his fear to even deeper faith. And our friend Peter when he was out of the boat and suddenly became more aware of the wind and the waves than Jesus, he starts to sink and he yells out, Jesus, save me. And Jesus does just that. In a heartbeat, Jesus reaches down and pulls him out of the water and Jesus walks Peter right back to the boat. Now, some would say that when Jesus said to Peter, why did you have so little faith? Why did you doubt? that Jesus was scolding Peter. But I have to tell you, I don't quite read it that way. We don't know the tone of voice that Jesus used. I think maybe, just maybe, Jesus was saying, oh man, Peter, you were almost there. Buddy, if you had just taken three or four more steps, you would have been standing right there with me. We would have locked arms together. But it's okay, Peter. You still have a lot to learn about me and about yourself. I'm going to walk you through your fear, and it's not going to hold you back. Because we know that in Peter's ministry, many times he was afraid, and he would fail. But each time that he did, Jesus was there to encourage him, to help him through it, to help him grow through his fear. And that's the promise that we have. God makes a promise to us in Scripture that he will complete this good work that he has begun in us. He's not going to leave us or abandon us. He's going to continue to grow us even through our fear. So I'd like to share with you an email that I received just last week because it really encouraged me, and I hope that it will bless and encourage you as well. Fear. I was so fearful this COVID-19 situation came out. I wasn't able to totally control my situation because my family was living with me, and they were still going to work every day. I am pretty much of a rule follower, and if the government was concerned enough to set, say, stay, that's exactly what I would do for as long as it took. Aside from careful outings to the grocery store every other week, I was losing my mind with fear that they would bring something home. They felt the whole thing was more of a hoax and still don't take it as seriously as I think they should. I kept to myself in the house and started reading my Bible. Fear over faith became my motto, if you will. Reading the Bible gave me a calm and I realized I needed this. When my mom got sick, I flew into fear again with prayer and the prayer of others, I quickly got back to faith over fear. I started praying multiple times daily, prayers for my mom and the people affected by COVID, prayers of thanks for all of the people who were still taking care of her, prayers of thanks for all of the things that we still have. Now, I'm not saying I am without fear, but I try to remember have faith over fear. He, God, will get us through this, whatever we are dealing with. Faith over fear. God will walk us through our fear to greater faith. Thanks be to Jesus. Amen.
Let us pray, dear friends. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to worship you because you are worthy. We are so grateful for all that you do to sustain each and every one of us and this world that you love. For your whole church throughout the world, give courage in the midst of storms. And Lord, when we are afraid, remind us that you are present with us and within us by the power of your spirit. You have promised to always be with us, to walk us through any fear to deeper faith. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that our leaders might have courage, compassion, and wisdom in making decisions that affect our health, our schools, our places of business, and that we might make good decisions about how to worship together. We pray for all who are in need of food. As the weather gets hotter, we pray for those without adequate shelter. We pray for peace for those who are anxious and worried about tomorrow. We would pray for a vaccine and even more effective treatments. And Lord, boldly we pray for an end to COVID-19. Be with those who are sick, especially Keith and Charlie. We lift up Chip and Christy. Also be with Jerry Royer and Joyce and everyone who has cancer. We ask for you to comfort those who have lost a loved one, especially Jennifer Swartley Lesser's family. May the presence of the risen Lord Jesus comfort all who are grieving. All of these needful things we leave in your loving hands as we say thank you again for the blessings of friends and family for this church and the future you have planned with us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, as we pray the way he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, dear friends. It's been so good to gather with you all for worship this morning. I pray that this service was a blessing to all of you. I pray that within it you heard words of grace and peace that will strengthen you and sustain you for the week ahead. Whatever you have in front of you, whether it's work or various responsibilities, I pray that this is a blessing to you. And I pray that if it was a blessing that you'll join us in the future, whether that be for another online service or whether that be uh, when we're able to return to worship again in person, I pray that you'll be able to be with us once more. And if this service was a blessing to you and you're able to, then I'd like to invite you to to support the continuing ministry of St. James Lutheran Church by going to stjameslimerick.org slash give and giving an offering or a donation there. All of the offerings and donations that we receive help us to continue doing the work that God has called us to do in this community. And we thank you in advance for your generosity. And now I invite you to receive the blessing this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Free. Who the sun sets free